Okay, welcome back. We are finishing up our videos on rational functions. So real quick, we're going to solve a couple more questions and then move on to how to solve, uh, solve just solve the rational functions, not just talk about their vertical and horizontal asymptotes. So again, we're going to find domain, we're going to find the vertical, and we're going to find the horizontal asymptote. So for my domain, I begin by assuming it's all real numbers. Then I look at my denominator. Can I factor this out? Well, if this had been a minus one, that might have been a perfect square. Unfortunately, it's not, so I cannot factor that out. So I go ahead and set the denominator equal to zero. And if I bring over that information, I already see something funky, funky happening. Ooh, if I've got a negative number and I'm about to even root it, what's going to happen? Am I allowed to square root or even root negative numbers? Absolutely not. So that tells me that there cannot be a vertical asymptote, or sorry, there cannot be any issues in the domain. So that means it is genuinely all real numbers. There's nothing down here that's going to zero out the denominator. There's no value of x that can allow me to zero the denominator. So I go ahead and move on to my vertical asymptote. So my vertical asymptote, again, I look at problems in the denominator, but there are no problems in the denominator. So that means there are no vertical asymptotes. So let's look at our horizontal asymptotes. So horizontal asymptotes, I go back to Bobo, Betsy, and Bachu, and I look for my largest denom or, uh, degree. And in my numerator, if I compare these two, this is my largest degree. And this is my largest degree on bottom, which means that I'm not using Bobo because it's not bigger on, bo on bottom. I'm not using Bachu because it's not bigger on top. In fact, I'm still using Betsy. So I look at its coefficients, which are eight over four, which simplifies down to two. So that means that I have a horizontal asymptote at y equals two. So there we have it. We have all those points determined. now. Using that information, I've set up a few questions here, and I even gave you a hint as to what kind of horizontal asymptote it is. So I hope you pause and work through these problems. For each of these problems, you're going to find the domain, the vertical, and horizontal asymptotes. Then, using a graphing calculator or Desmos, I would like you to check your graph. So graph the function using Desmos, using a graph, and I hope that you recognize that no matter which way you do this, you should be able to graph this by hand as well. You know, if you've if you've identified where your holes are, if you've identified where your vertical and horizontal asymptotes. So, for example, for this question, we could have created a, a graph. We would have recognized that at, at x equals negative three, there is a uh, vertical asymptote negative three. Sorry. So at negative three, there would be a vertical asymptote and there is, um, I'm bigger on bottom. That means there is a ver uh, horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. And then all you would have to do is create an xy table, plot a few points, plot those points, whatever this graph would look like. Um, I think I did that wrong. I think it would actually be on this side. Yeah. So let's say I plotted my points, put in my points, and put it down, and boom, we would have our graph. So I hope that at one point you stop and see if you can graph it by yourself. And this is actually the example that I would suggest you do because it's one of our simplest examples in this. Okay. Here's another one where I want you to pause, figure out domain, vertical, and horizontal asymptotes, and then check it against a graph. Here's one more. All right, moving on to oblique asymptotes. So an oblique asymptote is literally a slanted asymptote. And this happens when and if and only if. So this is an IFF statement, right? If and only if. Ah, if and only if. It has exactly one more degree of the denominator. So that means, you know, it could be... Sorry, I believe meant to say the numerator. The degree of the numerator is exactly one more. So, you know, in this instance, in this example, it's x squared over x, but we could also see x cubed over x squared. You could see um, x over a constant, you know, anything where you're one more than the denominator. And so that's going to have an oblique asymptote. Okay, and so you would figure out all the same information for it. You would have a horizontal, vertical, and domain, but you would also be looking to solve for that oblique asymptote. So I'm going to go ahead and solve this equation right here. So first of all, we go for our domain, and we assume our domain is all reals. We look at our denominator, and we decide that, okay, we got to figure out something with that denominator. Well, the first thing I have to do is go ahead and factor out my rational. 
And here, um, factors of negative 12 that would equal positive 1, that would add up to positive 1, would be 4 and 3, and it would be positive 4 and negative 3. Okay, now I look at this, I compare it to my top, I can't cancel anything out, but I can see that at this point, x equals negative 4, and at this point, x equals positive 3, that we have some funkiness happening. So that tells me my domain is going to be all except at x equals negative 4, and at x equals uh, 3, we can't have that. So then I would identify my vertical asymptote and my horizontal asymptotes. And we would do the same thing. So again, we look back at this factored form. Can I cancel anything out? No. So that means there are no holes, but there are vertical asymptotes at x equals negative 4 and at x equals 3. Okay. And then I finally look for my horizontal asymptote so I compare. The numerator on top is 3. The numerator on bottom is 2. That means we are bigger on top. That means there is no horizontal asymptote. Okay, but because we recognize that this is one of our vertical asymptotes, right? My numerator exponent is literally one more than my denominator. This is an x cubed over x squared example. Then I know I actually have a vertical, or sorry, an oblique asymptote. So with my oblique asymptote, I also have to take a moment to actually solve for that slant asymptote. And I've got it solved out on my side. I'm so sorry. Give me one second. Okay, and so what we would use is polynomial division. In this case, um, we could have used long division, and we got, and I did it on my side, so, you know, if you want to check your long division, here it was my answer. There we go. And I had a remainder of 26x minus 24, so I used my remainder theorem to add it back in. And so if I use this information, well, here's the slant asymptote. So I would have an oblique asymptote at y equals 2x minus 2. And I could use this to graph my function, but really I just want you to check it against a graph, make sure. Okay, so here's a few um, other instances that I'd like you to pause and work out. We have a common factor right here. So again, if I factor these out, I'm giving you the hint that one of these has to cancel out. And that was my only example. My bad. I thought I had one more. But now it, uh, we are going to move on. And I, I'm telling you right now, I'm uh, giving you a heads up. I'm pretty sure this is an oblique asymptote, but it could just be one with common factors. But we're going to go ahead and move on to solving rational functions. And so what we have to do is recall fraction operations. How do fractions work? Well, fractions work by using their least common denominator. So recall, um, let's say I was adding 3 fourths and 2 fifths. I would have to have a common denominator. 4 and 5 are not common. So I multiply by 5 over 5, and I multiply by 4 over 4. And now we would have a common denominator of 20, but I have to carry this over. So that becomes 15 over 20, and that becomes plus 8 over 20. And now we can add those up because my denominators are the same. Where I see confusion with fraction operations is that when y'all add and subtract fat fractions, you think that you can just carry that denominator over. Your denominators have have to be the same, otherwise you can't use it. When you multiply and when you divide, yes, you can just kind of work with what you've got. You can go across, it doesn't matter, okay? But recall, let's talk about the steps of solving the rational functions. First, you want to find a way to remove the fractions. Usually this means your least common denominator. Um, sometimes we can multiply simply the least common denominator and it's nice and, and easy. Um, other times, you actually have to do some fraction manipulation, and that's okay. Then you distribute your least common denominator, especially if you're working with um, just the numerators at this point. You definitely want to make sure you're distributing all of the multiples because you're going to want to see it as termed out as possible because we're going to want to get it equal to zero. So that's the next step, set it equal to zero. So then you solve for x using any kind of factor, whether it's use, pulling out a greatest common factor, synthetic division, um, multiply a times c by grouping, whatever you're going to use, you're going to factor it out uh, solving for your x. And then that's how we would solve any rational equation. Remember, sometimes with rationals, we can get e extraneous solutions. So technically, there's a hidden step five where we would have extraneous solutions, and that means check for them. So what does that mean? Plug in your numbers into original equation, 
And if one of them returns a false statement, that means that was the extraneous solutions, just like we did with rational, sorry, radical functions. Can't talk today. So I do have a question for us. I have two actually, but I'm going to go ahead and see you in the next video.